G'day everybody, this is a shock one because I didn't know we were going to do it. Um, I've heard that the remote ID rules going through in America, everything's great, it's a wonderful standard and uh, really I just want to talk to Jonathan about just how good it's going to be and uh, what we can expect. Have I, have I got the story right here, uh, Jonathan? Uh, <sighs> <laughs> there is a lawsuit challenging remote identification. Oh, that's a difference. So it's not all ripe and rosy in the land of remote ID. For those people that um, have not been following, have been having their heads completely in the sand, what exactly is remote ID? And why, why do we need it? Or why do the Federal Aviation Authority think we need it? Yeah, great question. So that the FAA was primarily initially proposing it for safety and security related reasons, primarily to identify the uh, the clueless, careless actors. Uh, it wouldn't really be that good of a mitigation against the criminal type of actors that are very intentional in doing whatever they're wanting to do. But it'll get kind of your, you know, your regular uh, purchased online at the big box store, went out and flew. That'll allow law enforcement to be able to identify people on the ground and be able to initiate kind of a confrontation to be able to educate them uh, and then try to wrangle in the situation. So that was the, um, I guess, the overall purpose behind that. But then uh, that is what was being publicly uh, told about, but there was, there's a lot more that was going on behind the scenes uh, there. So what was originally proposed was limited remote identification. And uh, that was going to primarily have your aircraft limited to about 400 feet for, from your actual ground control station. That's very problematic for all sorts of industries, especially like first person viewing flying and stuff. Um, and especially with trying to even make that work from a software equipment standpoint that's going to be a nightmare uh, and then there was also network identification which was proposed which required you to broadcast uh what's, what's called primarily standard id where you'd have a network component and then you'd also have a broadcast kind of component uh and if you had a connection cellular connection you could be able to actually send back your um actual telemetry uh to the faa flight information management system so that way uh, the FAA could know where your flights were happening kind of in real time. So that was separate also from a, just an aircraft broadcast. That was the concept. Then the FAA finally uh, proposed the final regulations uh, on January 15th, 2021, about a year later. So they originally proposed it was like, uh, December 30, 31st. They kind of, they do this typical like shoot and scoot kind of thing where they, uh, they dump it out right around uh, Christmas, New Year's and then run away. And they did the same thing this time where then we started noticing uh, some activity routing. Uh, I think. Oh, oh, oh! Was exactly. it me? Was it something else? And oh, you challenge need, after you, that. You need to rewind just a little bit there, Jonathan. You you disappeared. I thought it was something I said. And that was the. Uh, that's how we were going to defeat. That was the single reason we were going to defeat Remote ID and also win the lottery. And that's your winning lottery numbers. I'm sorry you guys all missed that. Oh, <laughs> no, we missed the lottery numbers. And there's some sort of lawyer like disclosure that you can't say there's numbers again. Some sort no. of lawyerly reasoning. Yeah. Void where prohibited. And by all that little like text at the bottom, it's somewhere down below. Yeah. You're going to edit that in post, yeah. right? It's going to be. And yeah, 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 yeah. I'll send it by post. I understand it still works in America. Wait, not um, I'm talking like post production, anyways. <laughs> post production, right? Yeah. Xjet, uh, Bruce, I need to link to your email address if you would like to join us. It is there in your email address. So Tyler loved it so much. He contacted you and said, Hey, Jonathan, isn't this lovely? How can I exactly make sure my machines are all remote ID level, uh, legal? Is, is that what happened? Yeah. Tyler, so what did you tell <laughs> so, so when the when when the initial uh, NPRM came out late December 2019, um, it was so extreme uh, that pretty much it sent the whole FPV drone hobbyist model aviation uh, world kind of uh, uh, you know we all kind of had to take a step back and like oh wow this is this is uh, much different than what we were expecting, um, and then people started formulating ways okay like. How are we going to be able to uh, continue forward um, or move on from this? How are we going to fight it? How can we improve what we already have? Uh, and there are a, a number of different ways to do this. Um, and uh, ultimately, um, uh, I, I, you know, thought that I should uh, or end up will be um, one of the ones that uh, helps lead the legal effort. 
uh, both because uh, a I have the drive and and uh, to do so I think that um, it's a worthy cause and uh, and um, you know it's 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 worth the fight uh, and then next I'm I'm very lucky in that um, I have basically the power and weight of uh, race day quads and all of our um, all of our customers uh, behind me and behind us uh, and so that at least gives us the ability, uh, despite being like a privately owned small business, to go out and, and challenge this on the legal front. So that's where I started started my search. And, uh, uh, you know, our, my goal was uh, to, to do it right and do it smart. And so I wanted to get out there and essentially find and put together the best possible team uh, of uh, lawyers and defense uh, for um, – FPV and the hobbyists that we could possibly find. And so uh, that led to uh, John uh, being chosen to help lead the team. And then Kathy Yotis, uh, who is a very uh, well-established um, uh, and very esteemed uh, aviation lawyer uh, in the DC uh, district court um, uh, to, to help us navigate through those waters. And then we've been very lucky to also have a number of uh, uh, pro bono and um, uh, kind of some, some guys step in and, uh, and, and just, just help, help wherever they can. I hope I answered your question. Now, yeah. John, Jonathan's got an amazing, and I've posted it in the link. Uh, it's an amazing, it's a long, uh, I've only found out about this about an hour ago, so I haven't really read it through properly, but it's a detailed breakdown of what's happened in this whole remote remote id space so congratulations the top bit of work that jonathan um what did you uncover what shenanigans did you uncover i think let's cut to the chase that's what people really want to know about uh there were multiple shenanigans involved every time <laughs> He gets yeah. That's hey. That's 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 what I pay him the big bucks for, you know. But uh, but yeah, I, yeah. I'll I'll kind of I'll kind of cover and you know so so he doesn't have to have to get himself in, in hot water there. Um, uh, we've we've been very very fortunate in that like since our cause is not just a cause of FPV um or model aviation or anything. It it really there's a huge group of people, millions of people here that this is affecting both current and future generations. And so because of that, we've had a number of people reach out to us anonymously, uh, anonymously, of course, um, uh, and kind of be like, hey, look here, think about this, um, you know, hey, dig into this a little bit further. And then we uh, issue what's called a FOIA uh, request, and we start picking up documents and trying to basically do our own kind of detective work. Um, and so... When we talk about shenanigans, I think the, the you know what what we're talking about here are things that um, aren't necessarily done exactly how they should be done, um, and uh, with regards to the rulemaking process on the FAA's part, um, and uh, you know the, the basic idea that uh, it was going to be and was very very difficult for someone to actually find out that these things happened, and so what it does is while while um, I think few people are going to argue, hey, there is a need to implement some kind of UAS into the airspace. Um, and that is the cover story for this. Uh, I think what we've uncovered and, and what I truly believe is that uh, there is uh, more on the uh, government's, um, uh, and this is totally my personal point of view, I might, I might add. So more, there's more, uh, more of a... Um, there's more intent than me CI uh, there, and so without saying anything, that is kind of what what we're what we're getting at. And uh, you know, I, I don't know how much uh, Jonathan wants to wants to get into it, but so far all we filed is the uh, petition for review. So basically saying, hey guys, we intend to challenge this. Um, uh, next is going to come a 30 page up to a 30 page, uh, basically just hey big long essay. Uh, that Jonathan and his team will put together um, saying these are all the legal issues with it. This is what we uncovered. Hey judge, what do you think about this? Um, and so that, that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. And, and with some of the, some of the shenanigans and things that we've, that we've uh, been told about. 
Yeah, the, uh, I think on Tyler's uh, website, right? Is it on your website or is it on the GoFundMe page? I don't remember that you put the uh, uh, FOIA documents. Um, there was a bunch of FOIA documents that we put on there. So it's not just like us making up conspiracy theories, uh, but it's actual look at the FOIAs yourself and actually see what we uncovered uh, with the multiple uh, memorandums of understanding that uh, that we obtained from companies such as like AirMap, Amazon, uh, T-Mobile, Airbus, and Google Wing and stuff. Uh, yeah, I believe Google Wing was on there. The, um, uh, all working with the FAA quietly uh, in what was called the cohort. And they were going to meet multiple times. And this was all going on during the uh, NPRM phase, right, where they've actually put it out for your comments. But then all this is happening privately behind the scenes where then the FAA is actually giving them more information. And we obtained, uh, I believe, Tyler, we have, we have the minutes already and the documents that they actually did in these public meetings, uh, as well as the FAA-created minutes, as well as the FAA con use. Is it the, it's a con use document um, that actually outlines what network ID was really supposed to be. And so everybody primarily from the NPRM phase was looking at it as, Hey, we're supposed to just downstream all this stuff to the FAA. Well, you look at the con use document, which was only given out to the select uh, eight companies, uh, the winners um, that that were in these meetings. Then what ends up happening is you start realizing that they want all this. This uh, the FAA has the flight information management system, and then they add other unmanned aircraft service suppliers. DHS, I believe, is somehow. I don't know if they currently have one or not. There were some documents we found on that. And the idea would have been then that the uh, DHS could then, or whoever was a, um, a federal government uh, USS, that could then query uh, those databases. So all of your past flights and stuff, and that's only restricted by the FAA. So this is extremely, I mean, Fourth Amendment uh, bells should be going off in your head. You're like, well, why was this not being disclosed? Why was this in closed records? Why was T-Mobile and Skyward owned by Verizon, the ones that stand to benefit financially off of, how, how, help me just right? understand. Sorry, Jonathan. Jonathan, just help me understand something. Are the FAA obliged to uh, uh, comply with certain sorts of privacy rules? And would this have been a way then of going back around behind what they have to comply with as the FAA? Is this is, is an end run? Is that what you guys say? Is it an end run around that sort of a thing? Is that what we're talking about here? Or am I getting it wrong? Oh, well, so from a Fourth Amendment standpoint, the Fourth Amendment is uh, the relationship between uh, the, you know, people in the United States relative to the federal government and that we have a right to not be having unreasonable searches and seizures. And so what ends up happening here is that through network ID, what you're having is people having their location on the ground, as well as the aircraft in the sky uh, transmitting back every second to federal database. That's what was being proposed. That did not make it into the final rule. But we, through all of this investigation, that's what we started uncovering, is that the FAA was going down that route. They backtracked and were like, whoa, we're not going down full network. We're going to go to broadcast module uh, as a substitute for um, limited. And then we're going to just do standard ID as a substitute for a network because they ran into all these uh, Fourth Amendment related issues. Um, and so what's interesting to note is if you go through the final rule, um, Study what's not in there. So go control F, okay? And just go look for certain things like Fourth Amendment, First Amendment, due process, equal protection, Constitution. It's interesting that those things aren't really being very fully uh, talked about. However, people are making those points in, uh, in the comments. And so the, the and also another one is uh, the word tracking, right? GPS tracking device, which is what... The broadcast module ID um, is, it's a GPS tracking device. And there's case law on attaching a GPS tracking device uh, on, let's say, a drug dealer's car um, or a bad guy's car, right, and following him around that you, you just can't kind of do that persistently without having a warrant. And so everyone's like, ooh, this is interesting. Let's back, let's, let's scrub the term uh, tracking. So look through the control, just control F, see how many times it pops up. It shows up in the remote identification arc and ID and tracking arc, but then you don't see it mentioned so much elsewhere. And then they intentionally use certain uh, analogies uh, that are not actually accurate. So multiple times you might hear them say, either publicly or in the rulemaking, that the uh, remote identification is analogous to a license plate. 
Well, if it's that's the license plate, then what is the actual thing on the side of the aircraft that we're required to put there under part 40, 4445, right? Isn't that the license plate? Well, then what is the remote identification? Isn't that the GPS tracking device? Why don't we just call it what it is? It's a GPS tracking device. So the FAA, in this final proposal, wants to essentially try to put out a uh, requirement saying that in order to fly in the national airspace, that, well, it's really airspace in the United States, actually use a very broad term there, not national airspace system or navigable airspace. They actually use the most broadest term, which is airspace in the United States. So the FAA is trying to even grab even more territory uh, than uh, uh, statutorily wise they're kind of limited to. Um, and now, if you're not flying in a FRIA or under a sub, uh, uh, you know, 250 grams, right, you're going to have to be standard IDing or broadcast module IDing. And that is a big, big problem because now you're forcing everybody to be tracked. And that's their way of kind of like, if you will, trying to get around some of these issues uh, with the Fourth Amendment. But interestingly, in one of the cases, uh, actually one of the Supreme Court justices uh, on this issue actually kind of uh, pointed out that, you know, hypothetically in the future that the um, uh, agency could, agencies could just try to actually require the um, uh, like vehicles, ground vehicles to just broadcast their GPS location and we'll just get around the whole warrant requirement with with uh, with actually trespass theory of where they were putting out. And so you see how they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa don't we don't have to touch it. We're just going to require you to put it on. Otherwise, you can't, you know, that's how we're going to get you. And so some of the judges saw that where this is going and how this is going to evolve. And so from, we have a big Fourth Amendment issue here that the uh, that the FAA completely didn't even discuss. Why was it that certain people made discussions on the Jones case or the Carpenter case? And yet the FAA never re responded to that. Control F, guys, Jones or Carpenter. Did any did, did FAA say anything? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> well, this is why you don't make rulemaking in private. That's exactly why it should be total daylight um, type of thing. So people, uh, SMEs can come in and weigh in on this thing before we waste all of this time and money on uh, f foolish rulemaking. Good catch, Jonathan. Good catch, Tyler. Yeah. yeah and, so, no, it's... and so can I... Uh... Sorry, go, go ahead. No, to you. No, go ahead. Off to you. I, I, I lost my train of thought. It's all you. No, I, I, I lost my train of thought. It's all you. You're good. I uh, know. I, I, oh, well, I don't think we're really surprised that this sort of thing's been going on. Now, the action that <laughs> it's a little bluntly, really, then, don't I? But the, the action that you've taken then, um, now that you've submitted your paperwork, did this, does this allow further discovery? What does what does this That's do for you right now? Question there. Right. I mean, so primarily, it it uh, uh, we filed it within the, the 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 required time limit to actually file a petition for review, which was sixty days. So if nobody filed, uh, I think it was on the fifteenth. But they didn't file by then. Then uh, the only way they can file it now is if they had good cause, and it's it's a very rare. Does the DC Circuit allow that in for a um, good cause exception? So. Unless someone else is filed, then this seems to be the only show in town. But I, I don't know if anybody filed there within the last window of a period of time. So I don't. We'll know shortly whether uh, anyone else filed. But this might be the only um, Death Star trench run going on. Yeah, I, I have not heard of anyone else uh, challenging it. What, so, let me just ask. You, so, what's your thoughts on this, Bruce? Oh, go on. Well, I was just going to say, so, you know, usually when something like this finally, like, like makes it to the NPRM and everybody's like, oh, this is going to usher in a new era of, and in this case, supposedly um, beyond visual line of sight is hanging on this RID. This is, that's how it was sold. And everyone went out and proselytized. And, oh, as soon as we get this RID and bring, get rid of uh, section 336, which I've been a vocal opponent of, um, it's going to usher in a whole new world for drones where everybody's going to be able to fly beyond visual line of sight tomorrow over people. It's going to be great, you know, yada, yada, yada. So then, you know, the detractors are going to come back and they're going to be like, 
these guys are going to kill the, be the beyond visual line of sight thing with their challenge to RID. It was right here. We, we were going to get beyond visual line of sight and drone delivery and my burrito and everything next week. And now they're challenging this, this well thought out, well planned RID. What, what do you have to say to that? Well, I, I would, I would challenge if someone is actually excited about that, I would challenge them to actually think about how they're going to feel when they have a, you know, 20 plus pound drone whizzing over their backyard as their kids are playing. Um, that's just my, my personal opinion on it. Um, but more largely, if, if that is someone's concern, then uh, I think they, uh, if they're outraged about that, they should also be outraged about um, how negatively this will affect um, uh, hobbyists around the world, both current and future generations, and some of the legal precedent that it will set uh, as, as John was getting at. So when you talk about, hey, you know, let's go 10, 20 years from now, and they want to put GPSs in everyone's cars, they're going to be able to look back at this and say, okay, well, look, it, it's already being done. There's legal precedent for it. It was challenged. They lost, so on and so forth. Um, and so he, he, here you go. Uh, yeah. Jonathan, what do you think? Sure. Yeah. So, um, the, the, the idea, yeah, I could see that there, this is back with like the Taylor case, the same situation was happening where, uh, you were primarily holding up the uh, industry from advancing forward because of the lawsuit, right? But that's the registration. And now it's the same thing again with, uh, with remote identification, but there's not really too much of an effort being put, I noticed on the commercial side, looking over going, wait a second, was there anything being done here unlawfully? And uh, why are we turning a blind eye to people completely not upholding the rule of law, the FAA, and not actually following the rules? Why is it that we're upset at individuals who are wanting to actually as pr protect their constitutional as well as statutory freedoms? Why is it that we're upset at that is it primarily because we, you know, it hurts our bottom line, or we, we think that'll, you know, cause issues, and we need to get more money, right? So that that's an interesting scenario there, because uh, if I were to turn around a little bit, but later on and say, hey, you know, I want our rights to be violated uh, because it affects my business, you'd be like, who do you think you are? And it's the same thing regarding um, the, the commercial industry towards the FPV industry, and, and I don't really understand that because at the end of the day, if the FAA is actually uh, uh, not following the law, then uh, what should happen there is primarily the industry should keep them in check and make sure that they uphold the rule of law. That's the real big issue there because the FAA has been given. So we have the federal government has been given the power under the United States Constitution to regulate certain things. And then the FAA has been given a power to regulate certain things based upon their statutory authority. And so when you have the federal government or the, uh, the FAA starting to do things outside of what has been granted to them in authority, then it becomes indiscernible to separate them from a thug on the street that is trying to assert their will over you. Right. right? Well, I had how, a red... How do, you, how do you say their lawful authority? The law is what gives them the authority. If they don't have the law, then they aren't the lawful authority. So the question here shouldn't be, you know, your opinions, but hey, what are the actual legal substantive arguments here uh, that you are alleging that the FAA is uh, uh, completely overlooked in creating this regulation? And could they, could they, we're kind of past the point of could they have created a regulation that could have uh, complied with, with uh, constitutional um, um, protections? that uh that we have uh, relative to the federal government there there that was an opportunity we have we well we had but then it's gone now at this point and why didn't the faa include more people in uh, the rulemaking arcs uh on that uh, why was it that they uh they did certain things uh in secret in regards to the network id cohort why was it that they did all that and didn't have more conversations about it they're probably is that the faa tell them to get on tell them to get on that might be. No, but my, that was a red herring question because, uh, to be honest with you, I never saw uh, the RID with the uh, you know, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi broadcast uh, actually being, let's say, something that's going to viably allow beyond visual on site. You know, the 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 eight hundred pound pack of elephants in the room. You know, until there is certified on board detect and avoid, or even until the FAA. Uh, comes out with a baseline for well clear or you know what this, this minimum is going to be there's no way you're going to be able to do beyond visual line of sight um, in my estimation as a participant uh, in this in the last 20 years 
So it, it was it was a total. I can't even. It's hard for me to even comment without uh, you know remembering that this is a family show and that I can't parse things with curse words. So I'm going to just uh, sign off. Go ahead. Well, but, uh, uh, so John, that, I, think, I think you are kind of. Well, you're not on, sorry. Can I just there. um. Jonathan, is it possible if you're not talking just to mute your microphone? I think you're causing all the, the chopping. Sure. Uh, either that or it's your um, it's your ID tracking on you. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, Patrick, I, I think you're hitting on a, on, a, on a good point there when you say that uh, basically you just said that, hey, remote ID is not ready, which is exactly what we've been hearing and inferring, which is, hey, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, sweet, FAA, they changed it. They listened to us. Um, awesome. Like, this is way better than the NPRM without first realizing how would you have felt if this was the NPRM? You probably would be like, wait, wait, no, that's that's not OK. Um, uh, but the fact is, we believe that uh, the remote ID is how it is. Uh, not because they listen to us or because they care or because they carefully consider our, uh, uh, the comments, um, but rather because remote ID simply, uh, the technology behind it, the network behind it is not ready yet. Um, and that makes a lot of sense seeing as how it was proposed a year ago. They started working with these companies. They just are not going to be able to move that quickly. Um, certainly the government is not going to be able to move that quickly and establish all of the requirements and the technology that would have to go into a remote ID network. So um, it's our belief that that remote ID network that was originally proposed is coming. It is eventually coming. Um, and furthermore, the FAA has said uh, remote ID is going to continue to be developed and it will come out. Um, so because of that, the re really the, the whether you agree with the broadcast solution or not, uh, I think most everyone does not agree with what was originally proposed in the NPRM. So it's important that we challenge this now because like we talked about previously, if we don't, it's going to establish a, bu a bunch of precedents where it's going to make it a lot more difficult um, should the FAA choose to uh, establish the previous version of remote ID that they had uh, and they are still currently uh, planning on uh, uh, making. Now, Bruce, you're a pretty good um, person for dissecting this sort of thing. What's your, um, sorry, Jonathan, I stepped on you. What's your sort of um, thinking on this? Well, grab a coffee, perhaps a donut, sit down, and I will explain. Uh, one word, or one name springs to mind, John Taylor. I think we've been there before where we've challenged the FAA and the courts have found the FAA was wrong. And then they just step in and change the rules or change something. So that my concern with this particular action is that um, Jonathan may well win this, but is he going to win the battle because of the, the, the entire war? Because won't they just step in and just sidetrack that and change the laws or put something else in so that they can still do what they want to do? And as Tyler said, this is, well, I like to think this is a thin end of a wedge. They started off with this grandiose plan, which is going to have all this network ID stuff, um, network tracking. And then when they finally issued their reply to all the submissions. If you search for at this time in that document, it's multiple occasions where at this time, we're not going to use network tracking at this time, which makes it very clear that the intention is to use this when the technology is available. So by sliding this in and saying, oh, no network tracking, it's just, you know, just a couple hundred meters, they've established the precedent that remote ID is okay. And then it's very much easier to roll it out and expand its power and its, its scope and so forth, because they've already, proven that it's it's a viable thing and people will accept it. So you've got to be careful that they're not going to start with, you know, the thin end of the wedge and by the time you're finished, everybody is split wide open because they've got exactly what they want. But my concern is also that this, as uh, Patrick says, this is not about BB loss. Uh, this which is sort of Wi-Fi or Bluetooth based um, network ID won't provide for BV loss. That's a joke. It's, it's not going to, it's not working at all. It's just not enough range. And it's not about integrating into the national airspace because as proposed now, there's no, it's not a, um, a sense and avoid thing. It's not a, a conspicuity thing. It's simply so that if someone sees a drone, they can see who's flying it. And it is kind of like a license plate. Now, the little, your um, registration number you put on the side of the drone, that can't be seen from a distance. So the justification is, well, you know, we can't, unlike a car number plate or registration 
plate. We can't see that from 200 metres away, so we need to have something that will identify the operator of the drone from 200 metres away. From where I stand, the whole thing is it's a, it's a, um, it's a um, presumption of guilt. They're presuming anyone who's flying a drone is, is trying to do something bad, nefarious, evil, unless they can prove otherwise. And I thought that was counter to the whole justice system where you're presumed to be innocent unless you're proven guilty. I thought this presumption of guilt is a dangerous change in the whole perspective on, on operating. Also, the thing is, I don't mind if they put remote ID and commercial drones operated by Amazon and Google and all the others, but we need to see what we should be pushing for, I believe, is a really, really clear line definition between commercial high risk operations and recreational operations like mini quad racing or someone using a, a small drone to get pictures of the local park or something. This totally different risk profiles, totally different everything. So why are they doing the one size fits all? We don't do it in any other sector of aviation or, or our lives. We stratify by risk. And no one has proven to me that there is any except or any significant risk associated with the recreational use of multi-rotor drones for a start. There's not been one single death. There have been very few instances of anything other than trivial injuries. But we want to introduce all these restrictions and our remote ID and things. Yet we've had people killed by pressure cookers used as um, explosive devices. No talk about registering pressure cookers, requiring people to do a background check before they buy a pressure cooker or whatever. Um, then They're not scaling the response to the risk. And that's, I think, if I was trying to attack this, I'd be saying, where's your justification? Show me one instance where remote ID would have saved one life, and they can't. And so I think all good laws and rules require justification on the basis of what they're going to achieve. Well, we've had drones, recreational multi rotor drones in the air for 10 years, not one single death. How do you justify this imposition on people's freedoms, on their uh, privacy? Because there is no, you're not saving us from anything. And the old what if, or it's only a matter of time, that's unacceptable. You, they can't use that for justification. Um, so I think the tech that's taken, I'm really concerned that Tyler's going to get out there, spend a lot of money, a lot of his own money, and other people are going to contribute and things. We're going to get a, a, a perfect victory because just like John Taylor, they'll just turn around and, and come in from another direction. And all that effort has been wasted when I would tend to think if we challenge them on the basis of prove this justification for this regulation, there's no proof in terms of that decade of history when if it was going to be a risk, we would have seen it by now. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, uh, you know, um, you're making good points, but there is no advocacy here. I, you know, I've been, you know, banging this drum for years. I mean, if you look at the safety numbers for light sport aircrafts, and then you look at the safety numbers for GA, and you, you have uh, multiple incidents, uh, you know, hundreds of deaths. And, you know, on one hand, they're like, oh, we got, you know, millions of drones out there. And, uh, you know, so if you, I mean, nobody wants to put up any money, even the people, you know, and I'm going to kind of people out on Front Street, but most of the companies that you hear they're getting, you know, tens of millions of uh, VC capital don't want to put up even forty or fifty thousand uh, dollars to do some advocacy on this. But you're exactly right, Bruce, and I think that everyone here is right. I mean, everyone's got you know, RC hobby aviation is self limiting. You fly beyond visual line of sight without um, autonomous aids, and you're going to, you know, do the walk of shame and have your pile of garbage. The notion that you have to have some sort of broadcast ID to fly a piece of, you know, 12 ounces of foam in the park is ridiculous to me. It's a power grab. Someone's trying to grow the business. They should be concentrating on things like, uh, you know, the Max 737 Max. Obviously. The other thing that well, the other thing that concerns me too is that any claims that this is about safety, you know, this is um, is going to be anti un unconstitutional. Is what we're looking for. Anything that's going to be a breach of the constitution, surely the U.S. government's response is safety and security. Constitution doesn't matter when it's safety and security. How many constitutional rights have been abridged or reduced? on the basis of homeland security, safety and security, everything we've got to do to protect the American people so the, the constitution doesn't count anymore. Rupert, oh, sorry, Jonathan probably knows this. Um, is that the case? Because I get the perception from outside the USA that a lot of constitutional freedoms and rights have been very much abridged in the name of safety and security. Is that really what's happening? Jonathan, wake up. <laughs> there you go. That, that the, the mic wasn't popping off. Uh, the uh, so constitutional is quite. A, there's a couple constitutional issues. 
uh, at play. One of the biggest ones is the Fourth Amendment, uh, specifically if you look at like the Carpenter case, the Jones case, and how that those uh, those cases went down with the GPS tracking devices and just uh, persistent surveillance on an individual. And you can see where they go over time. You can see their controller on the ground. You can see other aircrafts. You can potentially make, figure out more about that person primarily based by a Latin along and a particular um, uh, time, right? So I can then match that up and be like, oh, that individual is at a Biden rally. That individual is at a Trump rally, right? That individual was a, a pick whatever religion you want, right? You can automatically start just by doing that, start building a profile on that individual. And um, so that that's a big issue right there um, that's built into the Fourth Amendment. Um, and it wasn't reasonably tailored primarily to what evil it was trying to encounter, right? So what ends up happening here is it wasn't like remote ID was required for use. It wasn't saying you need to have remote identification on your aircraft primarily to operate around a military base or an airport or a chemical factory, nuclear power plant, any of those typical things that people probably in society would be like, yeah, I could see that's potentially much more of a terrorist kind of target um, or, or more sensitive or more of a safety security related issue. But instead they applied it to all manned, all unmanned aircraft over 250 grams uh, flying outside of the Frias. And so you pretty much have everyone everywhere for every reason, right? Uh, at all times. Uh, and that's where you then go, that doesn't make any sense. Why didn't you properly uh, uh, tailor it? Um, so, I mean, so that's one issue just to kind of back it up, just kind of bring some clarity as to currently what is an effect and what is not in effect is that uh, on January the uh, I mean January fifteenth the final rule was published and it went into effect. Well, yeah, it went into effect some parts here and there. The, the FAs changed it twice now with certain implementation dates. Also with over people and night also came out. Uh, but broadcast module ID is uh, a requirement as well as a standard ID requirement unless you are flying in a Freya or below two hundred fifty grams. Um, those compliance dates, and when you need to actually do that is later on in the future. Okay. Uh, so you don't have to like immediately comply with all of these regulations. Now there's, there's some in the future, but they're actually in force now to be complied with later on the idea we're getting into now network ID. Uh, and, and Bruce pointed out, there's multiple instances where the FA is like, well, we're kind of, we're going to work that out. We're going to maybe, uh, especially with, like session ID and protecting people's privacy because you're going to have a unique identifier. Uh, on the standard aircraft, and they haven't worked that out on how to protect your privacy for the standard aircraft. And so they're just going to work on that later on. So we have that going on. We also have uh, the manufacturers for standard aircraft, as well as the uh, broadcast mod modules, that they're going to have to be going and obtaining these approvals from the FAA. We don't really fully understand understand what that's going to be like and all those regulatory costs that are going to be built into the in, uh, drones that we're going to have to actually be purchasing, right? So you have that. Also, how difficult will it be for uh, uh, community-based organizations, right? These certain nonprofits to be actually recognized or is it primarily the FAA is going to make it extremely stringent so only there's one pr primary predominant uh, CBO uh, going on, right? Are they going to restrict that? Is it going to be difficult? Um, is, you know, one group particularly grandfathered in and the next guy is going to get harder? What happens when we apply for free is how difficult is it going to be to apply for uh, uh, for for a free to actually obtain that uh, designation. So, um, and even with network, what if in, uh, entities want to actually start doing network identification? It's not currently a requirement uh, to do network ID in lieu of a broadcast or standard ID. Uh, but I know that uh, certain commercial entities are going to be very interested in trying to do that, such as like package delivery, because the idea would be then you could actually just put sensors around in certain areas and now you can listen passively on 2.4, right? Because everything's transmitting on 2.4. Now you just put it up high enough. Now I'm able to gather all sorts of competitive intelligence on my competitors. So there's a whole bunch of that going on. And that cuts all different ways, right? Now the cops all have to figure out how to protect their flights from remotely IDing because I'm sure sorts, all sorts of particular entrepreneurial pharmaceutical manufacturers would love to uh, evade their uh, uh, aerial data collection, right? So uh, uh, so they might get in on that. And so there, there's a whole host of issues here that were we're wondering about how, how difficult will it be to actually attain a COA from uh, the remote identification requirements, right? Is it going to be a different standard for the law enforcement or everyone else? What about the FPV racers who want to be FPV racing at a low to the ground? Are they going to be particularly uh, treated the same as the uh, uh, law enforcement, at, you know, with the same uh, request? So there's a whole host of we don't fully understand all of the regulatory uh, cost because we don't know the full final manifestation all of these issues uh, but right now we know broadcast module id and a uh, standard aircraft id actually are final rules with compliance dates later on in the future
And it, it, yeah, it's uh, Bruce, really Bruce and Patrick. Sorry. Sorry, buddy. I, uh, so uh, Bruce and Patrick, I, you guys were hitting on some really good points before. And I'll kind of like uh, uh, Jonathan is like defense for all of us. And I'll kind of be in defense of Jonathan a little bit. We, um, I'll just say that we're, we're being very careful about what we put out there and uh, uh, the arguments that we publicly make so that we can kind of, uh, you know, as, as Bruce said, win the war, not the battle. Um, so, you know, Bruce, to, to your, to your concern, uh, that was something that we very, uh, first talked about and considered when we started putting together the case and our big picture, uh, game plan here in that we, we know what they're going to do in that if we poke a hole in somewhere, they're going to go back, they're going to fix it. It's going to come back, uh, exactly how it was, uh, but with that hole fixed. Right. Um, however, the benefit there is that. Uh, well, a, a couple things. First, that it buys us time. So um, it just, you know, if that takes them a year, two years to go back, fix, go back through the processes and then relaunch it again, that's a year or two years that we don't have to uh, put up with this. Um, additionally, in most cases, it's going to allow us to kind of reload our, our war chest, as Jonathan likes to say it. So, um, you know, if, if we go out there and, and uh, uh uh, point out some of these flaws that will allow us to uh, get back our legal fees, and then we can kind of start back from the day from from uh, from step one as far as financially speaking. Um, but big picture, we're not we're we're much further along. So um, when we talk about you know what's what's our goal here is that our goal is is to win the war. The war meaning that we want the hobbyists. Uh, regardless of what you're flying, to be able to fly as we have been flying for the last 100 plus years um, uh, in a safe manner. Um, and so as soon as that is done, we will be like, okay, cool, sounds good. Uh, thank you guys for your time. Um, and that is the war for us. The war is not getting remote ID to totally go away. Remote ID is not going to go away. It is coming. Um, it is just a matter of trying to carve out a space for the hobbyists uh, so that we do not have to uh, abide by the same things that Amazon is going to have to do when they send a drone to go uh, deliver, you know, something X number of miles away. Um, and then as, as you brought up, like using safety as a, uh, as a, as a defense, um, that is exactly, uh, I think you had a lot of good points there. And um, that is something that we have discussed and we are ready to uh, to counter um, as soon as that becomes a thing. I think the license plate um, analog is, is a good one because if you wanna drive your car on the public highway, you need a license plate. But if you wanna drive your car around your own property in a, in a muddy field at the back, you don't need a license plate. So what we should be perhaps pushing for is that hobbyists are given a piece of airspace, zero to 100 feet, zero to 150, which is considered to be private property. And you don't need to have a registration plate on private property. So if we can get some airspace designated out for us, then that basically makes it all go away. And even if that airspace is only over, um, not free is, but non-public places where we have permission to fly, no remote ID required, then surely then the whole thing becomes moot and we can get on with what we do and leave the commercial operators to get involved in the remote ID thing and pay their bills and you know fiddle the stuff to their equipment. So I, I really do think that perhaps the most pragmatic solution is this, this separating us out from the rest of the um, UAS community, the commercial operators who need remote ID, they need conspicuity as well, but we don't, we're flying in, in, in low altitudes where there's no manned aircraft, there shouldn't be any other commercial drones even in a lot of these places, so why bother burdening us with that overhead, that cost, that uh, imposition on our privacy? So yeah, I, I don't know, but that's just one take that I'd take if I was sort of fighting this battle. Yeah, totally, and, and like I talked about, like that, uh... That discussion on who owns what airspace, that is, uh, that is a rather nuclear option, right? But we're ready to, to deploy it if we have to, because this is going to bring in a lot of different areas. And that is definitely, definitely not just going to affect uh, FPV drones or uh, your local model uh, aviation hobbyist. Okay, so, um, so but those are, those are all things like there is our, we have um, many, many arguments. Uh, against this. And so we are carefully considering 
um, hey, we want to win this battle. We want to win this battle. Do we want to really go for that uh, that jugular right off the bat, or is that something that that we're going to reserve um, if if we must? Um, and so, you know, th these are all things that, that we've talked about. I think you're you're totally correct, and a a viable solution, which uh, you know I've 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 put out there, is you know exactly like you, like you said, not necessarily that um, uh, the FAA cannot regulate from zero to two hundred feet, but rather that this regulation only goes into effect for aircraft operating above X altitude. Um, and I think that is, that would be a win for us. And that would, uh, that would, that would pretty much, uh, I would assess probably be the end of our, end of our, uh, end of our fight. I'm super impressed. <laughs> well done you. And I'm wondering what, um, I'm wondering what can be done to bring along more of the community because across the world name a country doesn't matter whichever country it is most hobbyists have not really spent the time to to keep pay attention to what they're doing they're probably the first time they think about their model aircrafts on friday afternoon and they're thinking when they're in the pub having had a long day at work tomorrow i'm going to go and fly my plane and that's probably about as much as they are uh, as much as thought as they give to their hobby uh for the entire week and we're missing them we're missing them in in the voice side of this thing uh and making making a push so have you thought how you might reach out to, to the ama or an, anyone else like that i don't think the ama is 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 part of the equation the ama is looking after the ama that's why the freer they're embracing this freer thing because we've got the freers and if you want to fly to freer you come and join us and give us your money and and we'll represent you as an ama not as a hobbyist not as a member of this global committee we'll represent you as a member of the ama and that basically fragments the hobby it doesn't unify it, it fragments it we need people we need rules that apply to everybody regardless of their membership status with an organization because the hobby isn't just people who belong to the ama that's just my opinion mine yeah yeah well no you're not wrong but i think we, we, the the voice isn't loud enough is it and plainly the voice is loud enough from the several companies that got themselves onto that group uh of the chosen few uh and they've got the cash and they've got the the runways for xfaa employees to um to jump onto when when they need it's time to retire um yeah. that's not on the thing that annoys me most is that almost every country in the world now there are more registered drone flyers than manned aviators yet the voice of the drone population is this big and manned aviation is this big what happened to democracy what happened to one one person one vote one person one voice we we we're, we're being our importance is being diminished yet the regulation is being increased we need as a community to stand up and say no i'm sorry look there, there are a million plus of us in the usa how many manned aviators are there in the usa well we are the majority it's time we started dictating some of the perspectives and the rules and it's time maybe that manned aviation regulations were changed to reflect the changing environment of airspace use. And if it is becoming dangerous for manned aviation in the, in the era of the drone, then maybe the rules for manned aviation need to change to reflect that increased danger. Instead of just making the new guy has to change, the new guy has to change. But you're right, there's not much in the way of um, militant movement in the drone community. Everyone's just, you know, Oh, as long as I can go and fly, I don't care. But you've got to think ahead. Excuse me, cat. Um, you've got to think ahead and plan for the future because if we don't take action now, by the time we wake up and say, oh, this is no good, it's too late because the thin end of the wedge is well embedded and, and everyone is accepting what's happened. And it's much easier to stop bad things happening than to reverse them once they've happened. Yeah, totally. And that, and that is um, a big reason that we are still continuing with this case, despite a lot of people said, well, I mean, broadcast isn't that bad, you know, X, Y, and Z company, they already said that they're going to go make this molecule. They said it would be really easy. And so I'll just get that and then we're good. Um, when, you know, that is, this is simply the, uh, the, the, the tip of the iceberg. As far as getting our voice out there, um, you know, I, I feel like we, uh, we, are, we are trying to do that right now uh, through efforts like this. Um, and you know other interviews and articles that that will be coming out uh but 
the benefit of the legal fight is that, hey, we can put out 50,000 plus comments and they can just disregard them. We can go to the DAC meeting, we can tell them what, what we think and they can just disregard it. But this is going to be a single courtroom where it is us, them and a judge. And uh, and and, you know, I, I think in our in our system, that is that is as good as as we are going to get. I think we also need to recruit more of the public. We are vilified in the media and therefore the public are, you know, they, you know, they see drones as evil and dangerous. And we need this remote idea to protect us from these evil drone flying people. We need to change the tide of public opinion to quite a degree. And I notice, interestingly enough, Amazon and Google are also going to have to do this because there's a lot of the, the people that hate our drones hate their drones as well. So it's making it difficult for them. At some stage, even Amazon and Google will have to try and work to make drones uh, fluffy and cuddly and popular and lovable, um, we need to start that trend now because if we get the, the public on our side, it becomes much easier for us to to sway the politicians who then basically dictate what happens with the rules. And I don't think we're doing enough as a community to, to get the public on our side. I mean, even something simple, like every time I go out and fly, I take a spare pair of goggles and people look through them and go, wow, I didn't know this was that good. In times of COVID, that's perhaps not always possible, but I think we need to do more. There's that... Um, that, that video, that documentary that's supposed to be coming out shortly on, on the FPV thing, um, which looks great. We need more of that kind of stuff, more e informative entertainment. Show people that drones are just an extension of that wonderful age old hobby of flying model aircraft. And they're not people out there trying to look through your bedroom window at night, you know, because if we don't counter that, then the media wins and, and we're seen as the bad guys. We need to be the good guys, get the public rallying behind us because it, it, the public are the real dictators of what happens in our society. I just realised that, that answering the older gentleman comment, they could have been talking about me, couldn't they? Not not you, Bruce. They couldn't talk about me. <laughs> but yeah, um, look, we've had 40 or 50 minutes of your time. What do people need to do to help? Can they help? Is there any way to send any money to you to, to help help this whole process? Thank you for asking, Gary. Yeah, so hey, guys, this is this is a, a tall task that we're going, right? Um, to uh, not only just research this, this case and then uh, go and uh, file the appeal, which we did in the uh, D.C. District Court of Appeals, um, but then to actually go and argue it. I mean, this is this is um, this is a tall task, but it's what it, it, it's what needs to be done. Um, uh, we are we do have a GoFundMe going, which has been uh, active since about March or April of last year. And so far we're up to 849 donors, uh, donating just over $41,000, which is really amazing. And, uh, we're super thankful for that. And, uh, you know, uh, race day quads is the primary backer, but we've also had, uh, at least 10, uh, other, um, FPV manufacturers step in in some way, shape, or form uh, to help donate to this. So you know, this is really cool that uh, as we're as we're getting further along here, it's becoming more and more and more of a whole community effort, which is exactly what it needs to be because this is such a uh, a, a, a tall task for us. Um, that being said, uh, every every donation, literally every single one, helps us uh, fund uh, more. Uh, more of a fight here. So the the more we have in the war chest, uh, the the better we can wage battle, uh, as as Jonathan would put it, right? So we have a GoFundMe link. Um, if you search Save FPV GoFundMe or RDQ versus FAA GoFundMe, uh, it should it should pop up there, uh, and it's also available if you go to RaceAquas.com and then go to the bottom. Uh, there's a whole article where we've uh, kind of laid out everything that we're doing um, and you can find the link in there uh, as well and even if you uh, can't donate or you don't have or, or you know even if you can't guys even to just uh, share a like or comment and 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 just get the word out there so that someone else who doesn't even know that this is coming uh, or could affect them uh, can learn about what's happening and and uh, and and we can spread uh, spread it that way so thank you guys so this well, is pretty, no, I mean, you've, you've aligned RDQ with this movement. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because it, will it mean your competitors are not going to push this hard because they might be seen as promoting race day quads? Um, is there a separate standalone entity that can run with this thing? And um, like a separate website, which isn't commercially aligned to RDQ. And do you have merch and stuff? Because if I wanted to support this, the easiest way is to buy a t-shirt that not only puts money in the pockets of the movement to, to 
challenge this thing, but also enables me to advertise the fact that I'm supporting that. And also people say, what's that T-shirt about? And you can spread the word. It's a, marketing is a very complex thing, as you probably know, being <laughs> in your position. Um, have you leveraged all the marketing opportunities to push not so much RDQ, but the movement, the, the support for this initiative? I, I'll say that no, we we haven't really. Um, we really had never even intended on on having a GoFundMe or anything, but we were so inundated with uh, with requests for that and requests in, in ways for people to help that that we made one when we first announced that we we're going to do this. Um, you know, the T-shirt is a great idea. I would I would definitely get one. That that would be super cool. So I, I'll I'll reach out to some designers and see what I can do there because I think I think that would be that would be cool. Um, uh, but you know, I, we're 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 just kind of getting into it. Uh, until now, it has just uh, basically been um, me uh, barking, so to speak, and 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 now with the petition um, and us still continuing, uh, we're we're showing some of that bite. So this is where it's going to start to get uh, a little bit more uh, serious as we start to get get out there and kind of get the word the word out. Um, as far as um, having like a third party go about it. That was something that we uh, considered and try and uh, attempt um, early on. Um, but it seemingly was, it was, it was very, very difficult to get all of uh, the powers that be within FPV to come together. Um, so unfortunately that that's kind of where we're at on that. Uh, however, I'll say that it, it is awesome to see that most uh, FPV companies have backed uh, the fight against RID in some way. Um, most have expressed support for the FPV Freedom Freedom Coalition, uh, and they've they've done a lot of work on the DAX, and and they they're always very good about uh, educating people about uh, what is going on. So um, you know whether you uh, donate to our cause or FPV FC or all of it or uh, just share like a comment, um, everything is is helpful, and uh, and we are gonna we are we are full steam ahead on this. One thing that concerns me, are we not overestimating our own importance as a community and our own size and so forth? Because I look at like the Freedom uh, FPV Freedom Coalition, fantastic idea. Everybody should join it, but they've only got a membership measured in hundreds, I think. When you look at the size of America and, the, and a few hundred people willing to get up and become part of a movement to protect their hobby, it's kind of compared to the NRA. I mean, it's like, well, we are such a tiny community. How can we have enough swing to change anything when you're dealing with federal government organizations? Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's tough. It's tough. And so, but I mean, that is that is kind of uh, that manifesting itself um, uh, has kind of gotten us to where we are now, which is uh, not with great regulation. And that is why we need to argue it in a courtroom. So, um, you know, th these are these are tough marketing problems that we're that we're trying to solve here. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, FPV, which is the world I'm coming from, is very very young, um, and so it it takes a lot of time for for those kind of relationships and things like that to be forged. And uh, I'll say, look, if anyone from the AMA is watching this and uh, you guys want to get in and be helpful, um, I, I am uh, readily w awaiting your email and your phone call. So, uh, yeah. And if there's anything I can do, give me a shout because, as you know, I'm an advocate for the hobby, I try and do as much as I can. And I think we all, th this is an American problem, but it's not, it's a global problem because what happens in the USA eventually trickles out to the rest of the world. So those people outside of the USA shouldn't be just sitting back going, oh, those poor Americans, they should be going, this is what awaits us. And everyone should be unified. I mean, we, we may be a small community on a country by country basis, but surely on a global perspective, we have a much greater weight of numbers. And we must remember that because we're small, we also carry underdog status, which goes down really well with the public. The little guy fighting, you know, City Hall, that's something that should always be leveraged to our benefit, you know, get behind us and show the, the federal government that we're not to be toyed with. Now, there's so many aspects you can come from with this whole thing that um, I certainly hope that someone's sitting there in a room somewhere doing the marketing plan, because as we know, perception is reality and marketing shapes perception yeah absolutely especially especially in this world <laughs> look we're just coming up on the hour um yeah i'm working on well, that bruce i i just haven't put out the stuff yet but i have some really uh definitive yeah well we look forward to to to, to reporting that and of course you can use ses news for your means you're very very welcome um and uh, hopefully our audience is on YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, and somewhere else, Facebook. Oh, yeah, that's the other place 
right now uh, can jump in. Let me share that again. Let me share again that uh, that Chrome tab with the fundraiser in. Jump in here if you if you can, if you feel you can, or give the guys a shout, Tyler or Jonathan, if you have some ideas or active intelligence for them because open source intelligence is everything these days. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much um, for taking the time to talk to us and reaching out to talk to us. I wish you all the best. I hope it's not deja vu all again, all over again, as we saw with the Taylor case. Um, but you've you've learned from that, I'm sure. So uh, <laughs> we shall look forward with uh, with eagerness to see how get on. Thanks very much, and uh, we'll speak to you again, I'm sure. Cheers for now, and dear viewers, thank you for watching. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you.